96% of our experience of life and 96% of our communication, what the psychologists call concrete or literal. And so if I say, this is a red pen, then that's the only meaning that, that those words have. If I say, that's a great chair, that's the only meaning those words have, because that's literal. That's, that's a direct, the words exactly what they, they, they're describing. 96% of our experience in the world and our communication with one another is in that area there. And there are other things which turn out to be around about 4% of our communication and our experience. And we need symbols. We need metaphors. Because we can't talk about it directly because words just aren't big enough. And so, you say, look, you know, oh, isn't she gorgeous? She's as cute as a button. You know, <laughs> as cute as a button. Like, if I'm hearing it down here, it just makes no sense. But we all know what I mean, because there, you, sometimes you just can't find the words to fit. And so we use symbols and metaphors to point us towards an understanding of something which is more mysterious, harder to describe, and then, less than 1% of our experience is with what we call the numinous or the spiritual mystery, all. And of course, this is where religious experience often occurs. And they are things we discover of which we cannot speak. Words don't do it. And two people that have had religious experience can communicate with one another, usually by saying very little and they both understand what they mean, okay? And so words just won't do it. So when we start talking about matters of the, the spirit or matters of the soul, the best language we have is here. This language here won't get us there. And the difficulty is we start talking using language up here in this section up here, and we forget and we think that we're talking down there. It's, it's really, really tricky. And so, who do we think we are? What do we think we're doing? I want to use that as a symbol to start. I think, oh, it's a big wall. I think the chaplaincy team is like the mortar between the bricks. And I think the bricks might be the students and the teachers and the administration. The groundspeople, the support staff, the counsellors, and the chaplaincy team is what holds the whole wall together in ways that we often don't realise. So you look at the wall, you don't see the cement in between the bricks, do you? It's just there. And every wall is a little bit different, so every school is going to be a little bit different. Okay? And so remember, we're using language here, and we must use language here because the work we're doing concerns ultimate reality, the deepest truth, the unspeakable things. And that's one of the reasons why um, so many religions have a prohibition against speaking the name of God. Because whatever I speak as the name of God is not God. And We, um, yeah, so it's a tricky thing for us to negotiate. Look at this. You're a member of a chaplaincy team. So there's two dimensions there, two things we need to think about. A member. That's really important. You're a member of a chaplaincy <coughs> team. That means everything is up to you. My friend Parker Palmer says, he's got this saying, he calls it functional atheism. He said, so many good people doing good work are functional atheists. They say they believe in God, but they believe that they have to do everything themselves. <laughs> you know? And so, like I said, it's the smallest of actions that will reveal what we deeply believe. If we doubt, we will believe we have to do everything. If we trust in God, we will be open to what God has us do and we will do our part. 
our part as part of the team, and the team is about chaplaincy. I'll give you a paradox. You know what a paradox is? A paradox, when we first look at it, looks like a contradiction. But the only way we can approach mystery is usually with a paradox. And so we hold both ends of the contradiction together and it takes us deeper. And Niels Bohr, the, the great physicist, said the opposite of a lie is the truth. That the opposite of a truth can be a deeper, even more profound truth. That's paradox. So I'm going to start with the paradox when we're thinking about what is chaplaincy all about? It's not being a teacher. It's not being a teacher's aide. It's not being a counsel. It's not being a sports assistant. It's not being an activities assistant. But the paradox is you may be involved crossing each of those fields. Your job is not to be the teacher, but there may be something when working and supporting with the teacher, you can be what you need to be for that teacher and that student. It would be nice to have somebody in the school for every time that there was a, an activity or an outing, we had an extra person to help supervise. That's not your job. You may find that by being involved in all the activities, you get to know the students well and they get to trust you and so you build up that relationship. Can you see the subtle difference here? You know, and the paradox? Because it's not my job to do those, but if the door opens and there's an opportunity for me to be present amongst the teachers and the students, then it's your presence is, is what we're looking for. Isn't that a great thought, Thomas Moore? Why do you think you're here? Maybe the work has found you rather than you have found the work. If it has, you can be really sure that this is your vocation. This is what you were called to do. And Thomas Moore observes that when we find our vocation, it's like discovering our soul in the world. And so working with the, the students and the teachers is, is something that's really important for your own salvation, for your own spiritual growth. And for that reason, we need to spend time like today. It's called formation. And formation is about your personal wholeness because the only gift you have to take into a school, or a classroom, or a bunch of students, or a staff room, or a playground, is the gift of yourself. The self that is made in the image and likeness of God. That means you don't have to be more than you already are, but it means you have to be authentic. Okay, and this is why Mark, Matthew, and Luke all said, I would like the scribes, Jesus talking to God. It was his self. He wasn't being a rabbi, he wasn't being a guru, he was being whole in a way that inspired them to want to be whole. And so this is why Jesus always has to be the center of everything that we aspire to. I see we have a very distinguished visitor this morning. Welcome. <laughs> Would you like to say hello to the group, your grace? Good morning. Good morning. Great to see all of you here. Well, we know the importance of the school chapter team, and uh, I'm very glad that you have uh, involved yourself in this particular apostolate thing. Because it's not a job, but it's a ministry, yeah? Where you give yourself and help the growth of the children. So we are very happy to have Uncle here, 
come with his expertise to help to boost you up. So I look forward to your collaboration and uh, by coming here, you are inspiring one another and uh, by sharing, you also help each other to grow better. So many <coughs> in the ACCS are very <coughs> active in uh, promoting this. So with the help, the assistance and all of you, I'm sure that uh, the school capacity will uh, grow and uh, produce a good <coughs> the trees and the trees. So thank you for committing yourself for this uh, particular ministry and thank you my good for taking time to come here and share. We are so blessed. I know just how busy our bishop is and an archbishop is even busy. <laughs> so this is what we're talking about talking about the identity and the integrity of our work will come from our own identity and integrity. So, we'll start to fine tune our work a little bit and think, what does it mean, the Catholic identity and the vocation to work in the Catholic school? And why do we need to think about that? Isn't it obvious? Well, it turns out that unless we check our assumptions, we have this problem because of the language where we use concrete words and we should be thinking symbolically. Uh, we talk about the flock and the followers, but that's not what we mean, is it? We talk about heaven and hell, but that's not what we mean. <laughs> And this is an important one. We talk about church, and the church is the people of God. And most of the kids that we work with, in fact a lot of the adults that we work with, will think of the church as being that. The church is the people of God, it's a living thing. And so we are often unaware of the assumptions that we have when we go about our daily stuff. So just by stopping, we think, hang on, what am I doing? What do I think that I'm doing? And who am I to be doing this? We start thinking how we are in the world. We're human beings. We're human beings seeking wholeness. A peace that only God can give. And that's important. Mm -hmm. Because the role of the chaplain is the one of presence. The gift of the chaplain is to be present. Okay, so how you are, how we be in the world, is important because it's easy to measure every other role by what we do. We're not human doings, we're human beings. And, and presence is about being. So, Chaplaincy, probably more than any other role in the school, causes us to have a mind shift. <coughs> because being is about, we talked about the identity and integrity, it's what we call the true self. That reveals something of the soul. And so when we identify the true self, we get a hint of what the image and likeness of God is. Termino Virtue is an Irish priest and he's a sociologist. And so he works in the area of understanding relationships. And he says faith is a co-creative adventure between us and God. The calling for, that word calling is significant. To engage fully as possible in the transform transformative task of establishing the kingdom of God on earth. That's what you have to do in Catholic schools. That is our role, is to build up the kingdom of God on earth. 
Pope John Paul said many, many times, lay people can do this particularly well because they're ministering to lay people. And lay people understand lay people the best. Okay? Sometimes we think I'm not holy enough. Well, you would not be in this room if God hadn't called you to be present. If God didn't want you here, your car would have broken down or the train would have stopped on the way. <laughs> there is no such thing in, as a coincidence when we really begin to appreciate how wonderful providence is. We tend to often think of ourselves, well, I'm just ordinary. You know what? We all are. Everybody is ordinary. And that's what makes us special. I remember the first time I walked into a classroom. See, I, I didn't become a teacher straight out of school. I did a couple of other things. And I'd go and visit my wife in her classroom and saw that she was always, there was so much joy there. She was having fun and I was working hard. And I think, I want to get paid for having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then the crunch came, I had to walk into a group of adolescents, a group of young people. I remember the first time I walked into a primary school, it was even more scary. You know, they were just all over the place. Oh. And what I found was there was great consolation in Scripture. And I hope over the next three days that you'll get a sense of this and discover that so much of what we yearn for, we can actually find the answers in the scripture. There's one problem with our scriptures. We've heard most of them. It's true. And because we've heard most of them, we're familiar with them. And because we're familiar with them, we think we understand them. And what I find I have to do every day with the scriptures is think, Okay, I have to now start afresh. What do these words mean? What do they speak to me today? And I've got to stop myself from thinking a holy thought. I've got to think about, now in the reality of my life, what is God saying to me about this? And sometimes my life doesn't look religious. It doesn't look holy. It doesn't look pious. It just looks like the mess of everybody else's life. That's where God is. And that's where God is most powerful. And so, these words came from Jeremiah in the very first chapter. And God says to Jeremiah, look, I want you to get... He says, hang on. I wouldn't even know how to talk to them. And God says to Jeremiah, don't be afraid. For I am with you. And I will deliver you. And I know how nervous people can be going into a primary school or a preschool or a high school. And a staff room in those places can be even scarier. Because everybody else knows what they're doing. Okay? And what they don't understand is when we get that wrapped up in doing, we forget about that. And so your role will always be different. Where everybody else knows what they're doing, you are there simply to be, to be present. 